Hello.
Okay, gang, Professor McElroy here, uh, designing what type, February section, GRA 3102, week two, learning module two, a uh, quick recap. Uh, week one, we did a lot of background work, a lot of talking about the history of type, a lot of talking about the anatomy of type, talking a little bit about type effects and just the treatment of type, meaning legibility and readability. Uh, we had three mini projects in learning module one, I think it was three. Uh, and we started to baby step through the process of the visualization of typography as a shape made up of positive and negative space. Uh, and we've continued that into week two. With it being Thursday of week two, it's kind of a good and bad scenario. Uh, I get a lot of student submissions already, which is awesome because it gives me something to post in the announcement section, gives me something to talk about, gives you guys an opportunity to share thoughts and ideas in the discussion board, the topic share area. So that's a good thing. Uh, but it also gives me an opportunity uh, to do a lecture where I kind of showcase some of the reasons why we're doing what we're doing as it relates to type and kind of give you some of that professional application and my thinking process behind why we're learning what we're learning and how we're learning what we're learning. Uh, and I love week one. I always get to see students explore the projects in different ways, whether it's handwritten or it's a certain application or they're doing cut paper, whatever the process is for creating those assignments. Uh, I see a lot of students do it a lot of different ways, which I love because I said week one that it's not about the software application. It's about learning the techniques and the process and kind of the thought behind what we're learning because we're really just taking letters, numbers, and symbols and using them as shapes in different ways. So great job week one. I think just about everyone submitted the assignments for week one. And I believe most of you have at least one assignment for week two in, which is awesome. Uh, we have type as animal this week. We have our uh, tongue in cheek uh, ransom note, kind of found letter cut paper thing. Uh, and then we have a, a book cover, a simple book cover. So uh, week one is heavy presentation. Week two, I like to take the three mini projects and spend about 30, 30, 35 minutes, somewhere in that ballpark, maybe 45 minutes, each project and kind of walk through the beginning stages of the project. So I can kind of talk about, you know, what we're trying to achieve, what we're doing, what we're trying to learn. I won't complete all three of them, but we'll at least start all three of them for any of you that are kind of thinking through the process. Uh, and then I like to, in under two hours, be done the lecture portion week two so I can give you some lab time if you're in the class or if you're at home watching synchronously or you're watching this later, hopefully you're dedicating a block of time like 6.30 to nine equivalent. So if we finish an hour and 45 minutes or two hours or so, it gives you time to play around. Uh, because it's TEC, I like to give every student a little open lab time towards the end because I hate to just be doing show and tell all night long. Sometimes I have to, but I try not to do that every single week. So I think everyone has submitted learning module one, which is awesome. So we're already perfectly on track, which means it gives us a little time to play uh, with learning module two. So with that being said, I am going to use Adobe Illustrator because that's kind of the program I use uh, the most as far as type goes. If I'm not laying out a multi-page document in InDesign, I'm playing around with type as shapes to make logos and different single word textual solutions. So for me, that's Adobe Illustrator. Everything I'm doing, you can do in Word, you can do in another program. Just know that as I'm doing it, you could be messing around on your computer while I'm lecturing. Uh, you can just be exploring things and just letting what I'm saying process in whatever works best for you. I'm going to take about 30 minutes or so to talk through a little bit of the animal type animal project. I'm going to spend 30 minutes or so talking through found letters, what it means, what it looks like, and what's the rationale behind the AKA ransom note assignment. And then number three, is a book cover where we start to combine the understanding of letting and kerning, and we understand spatial elements, and we also understand text as more as an image than as the written word. So we're gonna to try to wrap a bunch of things up in the third mini project. Uh, make sure that you're watching this lecture later if you're not synchronously listening, because I've had a couple of things float through the canvas that aren't necessarily reflective of the lecture, 
that I'm giving. So just make sure that if this is an asynchronous course for you, and I've already sent some emails out that you do indeed watch the lecture because I do talk about topics and about kind of deliverables and what I'm looking for. And so make sure that you're listening to the lecture as a reinforcer as you're playing with letters, numbers, and symbols. Everyone's learning some really vital skills. I think most of you are having some fun somewhat. And so let's continue that. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and minimize Canvas, and we're going to talk about the animal assignment. I'm just going to open up Illustrator. So if you're in class and you want to open up Illustrator, you want to open up Word, whatever program you feel comfortable in, I'm just going to open up Illustrator and a simple document, just a letter-sized piece of paper. It could be portrait. It could be landscape. It could be whatever. Uh, I'm just opening this one up because I feel most comfortable in it. Uh, when you're doing animal type of uh, illustrations using type. I, it was many moons ago, but you see it all the time. Like the Grammy Awards did all the artists that were nominated for awards in their lyrics. So their portraits were actually the lyrics of their songs and they were in bright colors and they animated into the screen. This isn't anything new. Creating portraits, animals, objects that you recognize using other things, in this case type, is a pretty common thing. And it happens all the time. You can see it on magazine covers. You can see it in the lead-ins to articles. I mean, it's a really common thing. And there's a million different ways to do it. And each student that submitted the assignment did kind of a different interpretation of it, which is perfectly fine. Some wrote legible words. Some just used letters, numbers, and symbols. They all came to the same conclusion. They were creating something that was recognizable out of the shapes of letters, numbers, and symbols. So when I do things like these, I like to use graphic imagery as the backdrop for producing letters, numbers, and symbols, just to kind of show you kind of the thought process, right? When you squint your eyes at a photo, you see grayscale. If you squint a little bit harder, you should see distinctive shapes. The eye, the pupil, the, uh, the eyelid, the cheekbones, you see, you probably should see, if you squint a little bit to a photograph, you start to see blocks, blocks of color, blocks of grayscale, those blocks are what I use to determine shapes in animals and portraits and things like that. And then I layer text elements, bold, italic, and regular, depending on how dark that shape appears in the animal or the portrait in order to create my outline and all those elements. Well, the easiest way to get from point A to point Z when you're dealing with a portrait or an animal is to find an image that already is blocks of color. And the easiest way to do that is to search things like an animal name and the word graphic or logo or illustration. All of those things already have very firm graphic shapes and it makes it a lot easier to generate this particular style of design. So I went out already and I'm just gonna do file place same way you would do any program because I'm gonna bring a picture in that I can lay letters, numbers and symbols over top of so I can start generating this animal portrait and I've gotten everything from simple giraffes and birds to really complicated lions with all the hair being sentences and everything. So the interpretation of how detailed this thing is, is a wide spectrum, whether you're going more for realism, where the letters, numbers, and symbols are really small, or if you're going towards something a little more graphic, that's something that uh, is more logo style. So if you do just typography, animals. And I'm just going to go over to the image search because look at the difference between the lion and the kitten. I mean, it can't be any more different. There's a lot of styles and interpretations. So I'm going to do something kind of in between these two things in my lecture. And you can actually see when you scroll down, there's all kinds. Look at this little squirrel. Like he's phenomenally well done right? There's all different styles of ways to interpret these kind of uh, illustrations or caricatures using typography. I've had students before and they really got into this thing and they created something really involved like this lion thing and they ended up printing it out and using it as a work of art in their house. I've had people do uh, food and they've done uh, they put it in their kitchen, they print it out and put it in their kitchen. It's a fun exercise in seeing beyond the letter as a sound and more into a shape. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and minimize that. I'm gonna minimize Canvas. And here's my Illustrator, right? So you can do this in Word the same way that you can do it in Illustrator. I'm just gonna place an image and you're gonna notice that I grabbed an eagle. So this thing 
is the thing that I saved from the internet. And the reason I saved it is because if I squint my eyes, there's navy blue, there's gray, and there's two shades of yellow. That's it. And you can already see that the strongest is the navy blue. What I would consider the middle tone is the yellow and oranges. And what I would consider the lightest tone is the gray scale. So when you're looking for animals or portraits, you're looking for something that has graphic color separation. So if you search for logo or illustration or icon, when you're looking for something, you get something much more graphic. This really helps versus a photograph of an eagle where you're trying to separate the head. Uh, and we're just using it as a template because in the end, this thing, our image isn't gonna look anything like this anyway. I mean, honestly, I could do the very best I could and it's not gonna have a gray out, uh, blue outline. It's not gonna have this gray separation. Although if I use italic and produce the word eagle over and over again, I could create something that feels gray scale, but it's not gonna be gray fill. And then the beak of course has these two shades. And so I can try, I can get close, uh, but odds are I'm not gonna get the same effect out of it. So I'm using this as a template to lay my letters down on. So immediately I'm just gonna go in and I'm gonna type the word eagle in all caps, right? I'm gonna type the word eagle and I'm just gonna open up my character palette just like you would do in any program. And I'm gonna make an italic version of it just because that's different than this. And then I'm gonna take a version and I'm gonna make it bold, right? So this last one, I'm gonna make bold just so you can see the thought process. And I'm gonna make it a little bigger so you just get an idea. So let's go in here and I'm just gonna bump this up to I don't know, 24, 25 point roughly. And so let's make this one roughly 24, 25 points. So let me do that. Now I'm gonna make this one about 24, 25 point. And so you can already see this is navy blue. This is the orangish yellow, because look at the difference in visual hierarchy. One's a lot heavier than the other one. And this, in essence, is the gray scale. When you lean something in italic, it kind of gets that lean going to it. And then uh, that creates kind of that mid-tone shade. So my brain is like, okay, now I've got to create something that re is reflective of these three shades of color. And I'm going to use typography to do it. And I'm going to go one step further and I'm going to take these three elements and I'm just going to make a copy of them. And I'm going to make the first one just a regular E because there are nuances of each one of these layers that may require an individual letter, not a word. And I noticed that the students, they write words and they write sentences and they have fun playing around. And sometimes they put descriptors on the animal that they're doing like fluffy and cute and mean and hairy and whatever those characters traits are, which is awesome too. So I'm just using these basic elements. Uh, many of you created some version of uh, an outline, kind of using letters or words or sentences, and you trace the outline of this. Perfectly fine way to create the shape of this. I'm actually going to use the word eagle in bold in order to create this thick outline that goes around it. So I'm going to select this eagle and I'm going to go into the properties and I'm just going to lighten it up a little bit. So I'm going to change the opacity on this thing. In Word, it, it wants you to do file place as template and place as template does the exact same thing of the, as this. If you're using some other kind of program, see if in the properties area, there is a way to lighten the image or change the opacity of it in order to make a watermark. If I didn't do this and I left it at 100%, which is perfectly fine too, I would change these letters to white so I could see them on the beak as I'm outlining them. Then when I'm done, I can always delete the eagle and select all my text and make it, make it black or blue or gray or whatever I wanna do. But I'm just lightening it as a different option so that you can see the template and you can see what I'm working on. So let me go back into the eagle and I like to do about 23% or somewhere roughly in that area. And so now you could see my eagle there. I'm gonna zoom into the beak cause I'm gonna quickly work my way around the outer edge of this thing just so that you can see the shape. 
then I'll hide the template so you can see the words and you can see what I'm doing. I'm creating outlines and fill shapes and textures using type. I'm trying to separate you from the word eagle and lean you into the word of bold, italic, and regular, or heavy, medium, and light, just so that you can see how shapes work in an image. And that's no different than if you're layering pictures and you're creating an image of some kind where the, uh, you have multiple pictures and you're trying to create background, middle ground, and foreground. So all I'm doing with type is creating an exercise for you where you start to appreciate background, middle ground, and foreground, but using different kinds of font typefaces, family members in a typeface, so you can get the same image. So I'm gonna go ahead and make my copy. I'm gonna leave these as my template. So I'm just gonna move them over to the side because I can always copy and paste them and do the things I have to do. So I'm gonna go ahead and crank this down to 12 point. I'm gonna make the box not that big and I'm gonna rotate my eagle. So let's go in here and I'm gonna get this thing going. And uh, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna outline my type in Illustrator in this particular exercise, just so that I have access to individual letters and shapes. When you type yours in and it's in essence doing the same thing as doing everything with the E. So if I went in here and all I had was the E, I could rotate this thing and just follow along that line with the E and do the exact same thing I'm doing by making shapes out of the whole word. It all, all it is is separating the word into one, two, three, four, five shapes. So just be aware that I'm doing the exact same thing. I'm just using the word because it takes up more space. It eats up more space. So I have my little eagle word and I'm just gonna rotate it and drop it on that line, right? That's the beginning of my beak. And so I'm just gonna show you, and I'm just making copies of it, but watch what happens when I overlap my copies. Look how dark it gets right here. So I'm gonna create in essence, the navy blue in my eagle by making just copies of this thing and rotating it around. And I'm not gonna do the whole outline because I wanna be able to do several elements inside this portrait so that you can see the essence. But look how it's darker here and lighter out here. So the fine line I'm trying to dance in my demonstration is how much can I overlap the letters to create that dark navy blue. And you can play while I'm playing if you want to. You can just watch and listen to me as I'm describing what I'm doing. But I wanna go ahead and do the demo so that you understand if you already built the project, in essence, this is what you were trying to accomplish. And maybe you submitted the project and now you're kind of seeing what we're doing in class and you're like, you know what? I think I might wanna create that thing one more time. How are you like copying and pasting right away? Uh, just Command C and, and Command V, which is edit, copy, edit, paste. If okay. you go up here and you see that, that's the shortcut key for it. You actually have the same thing in Word. I mean, you just use Control on a PC, Control C, Control V. So when you hear me, the Apple key, which is now called Command, it used to be called the Apple key forever. It's just a quick copy and paste. So if there are certain things you do on your computer, you can save yourself hours a day if you just learn Control S is to save, C yeah. and V is to copy and paste, and Z is to undo. If you know those four things, I got I got Illustrator on my iPad uh -huh. because I want to try it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like super weird because I've never used it before. Yeah, so yeah. I have no idea how to do that. And then there's like this little little button you press your finger on and like drags it. It's like a little circle that you press on, and uh -huh. it helps you like copy and paste stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I still can't do it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've used Adobe Draw on the iPad. They now have Fresca, which is like Illustrator and a little bit of Photoshop combined. Um, they have diluted the toolbar a little bit on some of the programs. So there's different short key commands. Sometimes there's a little backward arrow for undo, like they have mm -hmm. little symbols now. So I'd have to mess around with it a little bit, but as you get more comfortable, the iPad is different too, because you're using touch screen. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the commands yeah, are embedded pen, in the touch. Have touch screen because it's like a dual touch. That you oh, can do. okay. Yeah, yeah. So you like press the, like, the little circle thing in the bottom, like drag it down and it like, rotates it or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. You hold the button down and the box probably activates and you can spin it too. Pretty I mean, much. 
traditionally, when you put your finger and hold it down on touchscreen, it gives you menus. Mm -hmm. So lots of times you just hold your finger down, it says undo when you click on it. So they try to take what we do up here and make it touchscreen enabled. So, uh, but we're doing the same thing. I'm just using the word to cover the space a little bit longer versus using the uh, letters. So if I, if I took this letter and I rotated it on its side, which is all I'm gonna do here, and I'm gonna just move it over here and I'm just gonna squish it a little bit. I could use that as my little dot in my nasal part of my thing. I can also use a period. I'm just trying to use the word eagle and just play around with it. You can see the rationale behind heavy things and notice the nostril is dark, it's navy blue. So I've associated anything that's navy blue with bold. Anything that's yellow and orange, I'm gonna associate with regular. Anything that's light gray, I'm gonna associate as italic. So in my brain, I've separated foreground, middle ground, and background, and that's how I'm creating my illustration. So I'll go a little bit longer on my outline. So I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna rotate it and kind of drop it into this area. And you're gonna notice that this stripe is a little thicker. So I'm gonna to try to match the, the line weight of this illustration a little bit with the scale of my letters, just so that you can see that the brow is thicker than the beak. So in my brain, visually, I'm just trying to adjust scale and proportion, shapes, not words, to match the visual weight of the object. And so it's really easy to do that in written word by just changing the scale. It's harder in illustration because you're visualizing something that you're not reading you're just visualizing shapes on a document. But shapes on a document are really important to control how someone processes your information. If it's bold, they're yelling at you, they want you to look at it first. If it's regular, they're talking in conversation. So it means it's like a body copy. It's like just a group of people talking amongst friends. Italic means that someone is talking directly to you. It's a personal conversation. So regular bold and italic in illustration is still yelling at you, general conversation and personal. It's just in color tones, shapes, and kind of visual hierarchy. So the reason we do the portrait, the animal portrait, is because I want to take you from the written word of bold, italic, and regular, and big, medium, small, and make an illustration out of it. That's how you can quickly appreciate written word in multiple languages. They all have unique shapes. They all have distinct characteristics. Does it matter if you can read it? No. Why do so many people have Chinese letters as tattoos, but they can't even read what the Chinese letters say? The reason they do that is because they think they're cool looking. They have a shape, a personality, a feature to them. And they didn't know if the person write the right word on there or not. I mean, they could say like, I don't know, they could have a famous saying, and it could absolutely not say that. And they would have no idea. They just thought it was cool looking as a graphic. I tend to really appreciate design, global design, design from other countries, because they not only see letters, numbers, and symbols different because of their language, but they see color different too. And their idea of good design or good communication can be totally different than our understanding of, or appreciation of design. So I'm just trying to push you out of your comfort zone a little bit and get you in also something fun to do. Is it okay? Like, you, you know, you saw my little like mm -hmm. type animal thing. It was like, I, but I used procreate drawing on my iPad. We were just talking about that. I don't care how you did. So, okay. So, cause I was like, I was like, I know it's like called to talk type, like photography and all that stuff, mm -hmm. but like I used like a drawing. She used word something or other. What was the name? Word art. Word art in order to create her type uh, image. Which one did you do? So I did the bunny rabbit. The little rabbit. Okay. Yeah. Who did the zebra? Who did the zebra? I was jealous. Because I was like, that's like really good. I forget which student did it. Was it was so good. Like they yeah. made the words like curve with the body. Yes. I was like, that was it, awesome. And I was like, I don't know how you did that. It's so, sort of like you're reading how it says the words make sound. The so words kind of, make sound. So, yeah, the words have to make a distinct sound. They do. So you're reading it, but yes. Sound to it. Yes. You don't even, you don't realize. But. And I caught myself reading your words <laughs> in the bunny um, because they were legible and readable. Mm -hmm. And so, versus 
the shapes that were squished a little bit more where you could still read the words, but I, I attracted far more to the general shape than I did the words themselves. So I started reading yours too, because it followed around the outline. Yeah, mine, mine so the video game. that's okay. It was fine. It was fine. I thought it was great. So, but it, everyone got to the same conclusion, mm -hmm. the same kind of outcome that I'm hoping that they come to, that they start seeing things outside of the normal. Because the idea of visual communication is that you see things outside of the normal. The more outside of the normal you tend to lean, the more some would consider creative solutions. Like I watch the Super Bowl because I do like football and I do really appreciate competition, but I equally watch it for the commercials because there are some really out of the box thinkers that do a lot of exercises similar to this to get them thinking in a different way it's typically a brainstorm in a marketing room with a table and a bunch of people thinking, but in essence, they're going to the same place we're going. They're just using different techniques to do it. So with this class, I think we, I, I'm sure, I know I do, mm -hmm. you see things differently. Mm -hmm. I go to a store, I see a billboard, and I'm like, oh, this is a lot, you know. You start looking at the kerning, the typography, with, yeah, what the type font is. And, you start using the terms absolutely which is cool too because you're starting to appreciate the negative is you start seeing how poorly things around the world tr truly are i mean i'm not even kidding you could see a billboard that they spent thirty thousand dollars on and the kerning isn't right and it's hard to read what they're trying to say or they make it really small and they put it at the bottom where the platform is where the guy changes it so when you're driving the platform blocks the words so you can't even see what they're trying to say i mean you start to appreciate and process good and bad and what's being done and the more low cost solutions there are the worse it gets right Unfortunately, nonprofits don't have a budget, so they traditionally kind of create kind of homegrown solutions and stuff themselves. But dear Lord, if I see another really bad United Way thing or something, I mean, I sit on a bunch of boards. The reason I do is just to help the people out sometimes because, I mean, it's just not good. And if it was better, they'd have more support. I mean, simple annual events where the postcards are terrible clip art and I mean if they just took a photo and put it on there and had someone that understands basic typography they'd have more investors they'd have more donations they'd have more things happening so I sit on the keep Lee County board because I just like Lee County I think it's a beautiful place and I think there would be tons of volunteers willing to help clean up a beach clean up a park just beautify where they live before I got there and before students helped and things gosh their t-shirts were like and I'm, I'm not saying it negatively, but they were just basic clip art things. Now people are buying the shirts because some of the students are creating them and they're personal illustrations and they're beautiful. So it's like they're not even going to the event. They're just spending the $20 on the shirt because they think it's cool. Or one person goes and they buy four shirts because they're like, man, this is a great shirt. My wife, my brother, my cousin, everyone would like one. So really quickly in design, no matter what class you take, you A, get an appreciation for the process. And B, you start to recognize things in the world that you never recognized before. When it was website, web class, you're like, oh my gosh, they accept credit card payments and it looks like a kindergartner made this website. Who in their right mind is going to put their credit card information in there when it looks like you know, the person had no clue when they were making it versus, wow, this site looks great. I have no problem putting my credit card. And it might not be a good site. I mean, but psychologically, you're like, this thing's beautiful. It was made in Wix to collect credit card information, but it's beautiful. Like I'm more apt to do that. Same with design. So the reason I like type class is because we get to play around and really just start learning visual communication. So let's do a little bit here. So I'm gonna do uh, the regular. So let's outline this again. All I'm doing is creating a shape out of it. It's the same as your little text box you're doing. So I'm gonna squish it down because look at what the difference is when I squish this little word down, I'm just gonna drop it in here. And I like to see things in shapes. So I'm just gonna drop that down. You can already see this is much heavier visually than this. So two things that will really control how people see the yellow area. One is the weight of the object, how heavy the foreground or the positive space is. 
and how small the letter it is and how close the letter together is. So watch if I make this even a little bit smaller. So I'm gonna hold down shift and make this a little bit smaller. Even if I copy this over and over again, as long as I don't overlap these letters, you're immediately gonna see upon squint, this is heavy dark, even this, it's only one letter, heavy dark, kerning, and letting in this area with a lighter positive space makes this thing not as heavy. So visually I can go crazy with this area. And as long as I keep the scale a little bit smaller and I kind of follow my shape and I don't overdo it. So I'm gonna do the corner of the beak. And now, you know, I'm using uh, letters as shapes. If I truly went in here and made these letters really small, like this lion image, one, I could make that tip a perfect tip because I would just make the letters really small, like the lion, and just follow along that shape and fill it all in. For the sake of the demonstration, I'm just going to do the very essence of this beak. And you may have heard this before if you've taken a design class with me before, but when you stack things on an angle, it's called stepping. Just like pixels, when you squint in and they change tint or tones and they kind of go from darker to lighter, those little squares are called stepping. The stepping is the same approach when you're taking objects and offsetting them and putting them one on top of each other, just like a pyramid. So I'm just gonna kind of step these words, stack them together. And you can already hopefully see that I'm putting a little space between the words and the kerning, so letting and kerning is being adjusted, and that way my image, so now if I go in here, and I'm just going to go in here, and I'm going to hide this for a minute, so now you can see, I mean, it doesn't look like much yet, but I'm going to get there, because watch what happens if I do this, copy and paste, bring this over here, I'm going to rotate it, I'm going to bring it and drop it in, and then I'm gonna do it one last time to get the angle of the beak. And I'm actually gonna round the beak off and start going the other direction so you can see what I'm doing. Now, I'm gonna to try to stick with the shape, but I have a little creative license, how much I overlap here. My type A personality, I would go back later and put more eagle words on top of there to make it even darker. But for the demonstration purposes, I'm just gonna quickly work through. And honestly, if someone's reading this, this makes a difference. Look at how I rotate this, this direction versus writing it the other way or rotating it the other way. It does make a difference when someone's trying to read it. But now watch when I hide this, I'm gonna go down to my template layer. And now you can start to see the beak taking shape here. So I'm gonna follow along here a little bit longer and I'm actually gonna continue the rotation so it's upside down. For some people, this would drive them crazy because it's got a different perspective. So watch what I do. I'm going to do that. I'm going to rotate it a little bit. And so everyone does this a little differently, but I'm trying to explain to you the, pro the thought process of why we're doing what we're doing so that you're learning an outcome that has a professional application and also starts kind of pushing your understanding of visual communication. So I'm going to overlap that just so that it gets a little darker there. And I'm gonna bring this, I'm gonna work over to the eye here in a minute, just so that we can talk about the eye so you get a little better understanding of the separation. So you can start to see, I mean, I'm getting there. I could get this line thickness pretty thick as I start working my way, but let's go over here and we're talking about the eye. So I'm just gonna drop my character palette down. And so what, what are my options? I'm gonna do uh, just a standard period and the pupils should be bold, right? Because it's a bold object. So let's go ahead and do that. And I'm just gonna outline it so it's a shape, just like anything that you were dropping in as a textual element. And I'm gonna copy and paste it. I'm gonna make the dot small now. And this is a really easy rep representation of what we're trying to learn, right? Everyone can see this, right? Here's my, my, uh, my eye. And so I'm gonna do that. And I'm gonna take my little dot here. I'm going to move that up, right? I mean, that's an, that's an easy slam dunk. I mean, everyone can see if I hide this eagle that his eyeball is right there. You could already see. I bet if I gave people 10 guesses, I bet in the first three, they might get chicken or eagle because it's got a hook on its beak. So characteristically, 
people see shapes, right? We talked about it last week. You'd write a paragraph and replace half the letters in the words, and they would still read the sentence as if it was correct. There's no difference here for visual representation of shapes. People are going to figure it out if you give them enough clues. So let's take this, and I'm going to sculpt this eye a little bit. So right, the eye is much smaller. So let's go ahead and create what we have to. And watch what I do with the separation again. So I'm going to zoom in. I need to zoom in so you can really see what I have going on here. But if I take this word, oh, I moved my template a little bit, so let's not do that. Take this word and I'm gonna hold down shift and just squish it a little bit. So here it is there. And so you're gonna see what I'm doing. I'm doing the exact same thing I did with the outline of the beak. I'm just doing it with, right? I, de I determine the yellow and the orange or some version of the regular typeface. I'm gonna do that, no copy and paste. And you're gonna notice I've got a little bit of a challenge because I've got a big one and a small one and I don't really want them to overlap because if they overlap, then it's gonna feel like bold and I don't want it to feel like bold. I want it to feel like the yellow or the regular of it. And you're actually seeing that I'm using this to create a shape without totally filling the shape in. So you can see that I'm starting to create the yellow part of that eyeball. So just to show you the difference as we're working, everything above here should be dark. So I'm just gonna show you the contrast so you can see what happens when I create the dark area of the eye. So let's paste that. And I'm going to squish it down. Remember, I'm a big scale proportionately person. So I'm going to take this thing and I'm going to flatten it out. We also know that this goes a long ways, right? That it covers a lot of the eye right here. So I'm going to take that and I'm actually going to use the same size of word, just angle it a little bit. And so let's copy and paste this. And remember, this is dark area. So I'm actually going to start overlapping this word to make it heavy right here. And so I'm just gonna overlap, overlap, overlap to really make this thing dark, just so that you can see the difference. So watch what happens if I even overlap where the circle starts. So I'm just gonna do this a ton of times. Copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste. And, and you're gonna notice that this thing is getting really dark. And so now watch what happens when I hide the eagle and you start to see the brow that's being created right here. That's the equivalent of the navy blue. All I'm doing is making the bold the navy blue. So this definitely is starting to feel like the inner part of the eyeball because it's not heavy like this and it has really good space between it. So now if I zoom out a little bit, so look at the difference when I really zoom out and I hide that. I mean, you can really start to see the eyeball here and the heavy line. So if I did that along this outline, I would get this really busy heavy line too. Would anyone know it was words here? They would have no idea, right? They would just think you scribbled with a pencil. But when I zoom in, I can immediately start seeing the words. So the process of the animal portrait is to get you seeing bold, regular, italic, heavy, medium, or light, or foreground, middle ground, and background. It's just a process. So I'm just gonna real quickly darken the beak a little bit, just so that you can see what I'm representing in the eyeball also in the beak. So I'm gonna make it really crowded here. And this is my type A personality. I would have done this anyway, if I was doing this for a client, cause they would be like, oh my gosh, that looks so great. And I was like, it could be better. I could add more words to this eagle. And then you would have no idea that I use typography. And I always do little Easter eggs in my design. So later on when someone says, you know, hey, I saw your design and I really loved, you know, the illustration you did for the logo. And I'll be like, did you know I wrote the word bagels inside that bagel a million times so that the illustration looked like a bagel, but it was actually the words bagel. And then it would be like, no way. And it's like the Disney movies where they hide little Easter eggs. And you're like, did you ever notice that the little mermaid had a fork in her fin? 
And I was really like, no, I never knew that. And so that's a thing now, or at least it's been a thing for a while, but uh, still a lot of people do it. I, my boys were watching the uh, Boba Fett thing that they had like on Disney Plus or something. So I got into it a little bit too, because I kind of like Star Wars stuff anyway. Um, and uh, at the end, they're like, you should go on YouTube and see all the Easter eggs. So I went on YouTube and saw all the Easter eggs. And sure enough, just like I'm doing here, People are hiding symbols, words, other characters. I mean, there's stuff in that thing that you had no idea. I really like Ted Lasso. If you ever YouTube Easter eggs for Ted Lasso, there's comical things about the Premier League symbols hidden all over the TV show. Someone's thinking about it and putting little symbols in the backgrounds of things that you have no idea that you'd have to watch 15 times in order to pick the thing up. But and you can see what I'm doing now. Look at how dark that beak is getting because I'm replicating over and over again. Obviously, the more time you spend, the more OCD you may have in the process, the more you want it to look real and less type is the more time you use bold, italic, regular fonts, words versus letters. I mean, I had a student do the Narnia Lion one, uh, one year. And this was a few years ago. And I don't know if you know anything about that. I don't even know what Narnia is, but you I guess a movie. Is? Or... Never so no, it's what, good. what is Narnia? Is it a It's like thing? a fantasy thing where these kids go through a wardrobe and they go into another world. Oh. It's actually pretty cool. Well, she did the lion by, word, by writing phrases from that throughout the entire main and made this ridiculous side profile of a lion. It must have taken her 20 or 30 hours. I mean, it really was really detailed and well done. I mean, obviously, the more it's words and sentences, the smaller you make it, the more compressed you make it, it's going to come out a little bit differently. I mean, if I was to go in here and just use the letter V, I mean, it would be it, it would be interesting to then use the word eagle. And so I'm just thinking of what shapes would represent what and how my brain could take, you know, the period for the eyeball and the V for the kind of tip of the hair. And then I just kind of cheated a little bit. And I'm starting to create the beginnings of those angles in the eagle. The reason I said logos, illustrations, icons, graphics as a word search is you get foreground, middle ground, and background much easier because it isn't a photograph and it's a series of color shades that are creating exactly what we're doing with letters, numbers, and symbols. So I'm just kind of giving terminology that would help you replicate what you see in the world using letters, numbers, and symbols. So for me, I took the eagle because it's just an easy graphic. So I'm going to save this eagle. Uh, so I'm just going to do eagle type uh, and dump it over to the desktop just because I have it there. And some of the students uh, saw the post from one of the students and it said, uh, and it had the words kind of into a shape. So I'm going to take a circle here and I'm going to take the word eagle here and I'm going to move it over here and I'm going to select so this is illustrator so one of the ways designers do words into shapes is they use some of the tools that are available in different programs so there's clipping mass and there's other ways to create words and shapes to create some of those icons that you saw in your uh, in your projects and or your searches for animals but Illustrator and some students or some designers use this as kind of a trick when they're creating logos and icons and different things for advertising. They do what's called an envelope where they match letters to shapes and the letters become shapes. And so one of the students did a horse or something like that. And other students have done rabbits and things. When you get comfortable in design software and you start playing with shapes and creating maybe a beak shape and then writing the word eagle and making it fit the beak shape. It actually can be done by scaling each letter individually to create this angle, or it can be done 
by having the shape created and selecting it with any text of your choice and doing what we call an envelope, which in, uh, in Illustrator, it's an envelope distort. And it's basically saying, make the text fit the shape. So make the text fit the shape. And when you choose that, it becomes this. And the interesting part about this is that you can actually pinch this. So this is like intermediate type 101 as it pertains to Illustrator. We learn in the le one letter at a time so you can get an appreciation for foreground, middle ground, and background. But a lot of those logos you see where they create an object out of text, they're using an envelope effect. And that term is cross application. So if you're using something other than Illustrator and it's using the term envelope, it means that it's attaching text to a shape. It's enveloping the shape with the text. So I believe Procreate has a similar technique. Um, I know that Affinity Designer, which is a $15 app you can download onto your tablet, also has an enveloping technique. Uh, I like the rawness of this to get you learning how to create density in an image by using bold, regular, and italic. But I just wanted to give you a little, little tip into Illustrator and how you may see things in the Google search that looks like this. The reason it looks like this is because the head was a shape, the body was a shape, and they did an envelope distort where the word fit to the shape like I just did with the circle. So uh, I always enjoy seeing how the students take their words, letters, numbers, and symbols. And remember I said, you could literally print out an image, use a piece of tissue paper and a stencil and do the exact same thing we're doing here. Would it take a little bit longer? Yeah, I'd probably use a Sharpie. That way I got from A to Z a little bit quicker, but you could do it. I mean, you could stencil your way through an image just like this using tissue paper. I learned with a light table. So when I was in school, we had images we would print out. I would take the image to a light table with a blank piece of paper. I'd lay the blank piece of paper over the image so you could see the image through the paper. And then I would either stencil it, hand letter it, do whatever I had to do to replicate what we're doing here, but I would do it in a tactile experience. And we also used Silly Putty a lot to transfer letters from documents and put them on other documents. Or I would fill the letter in, flip it over, shade it on the back so it would transfer the image from one thing to another thing. It, times have really changed. <laughs> but we're doing the exact same process just as technology has advanced. We have to replicate what we're learning as technology has advanced. So there's my 35, 40 minute demonstration for the type an animal project. If you already submitted it and you got your points or you loved what you did, great. If you want to tinker around a little bit over the weekend because you really enjoyed it, now you see the different elements you can create by doing it a different way. You might want to play around with it and do it a different way. There's no, you know, practicing. All it does is reinforce in your brain what you're trying to learn. So if you created something, you got a little time on your hands, maybe you got a little pad of paper with you and you're out with the family and they're, you know, shopping in somewhere you don't want to shop and you sit on a bench and you're just drawing little letters or something on a piece of paper. I use the back of my receipt sometimes if my wife is in the store, I'll bring out a pencil and I have the back of the receipt or a napkin and I'll be there doodling on a park bench or something. And she's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm writing the word eagle over and over again. So it looks like an eagle. She'll be like, you're crazy. My kids are like, dad, you're weird. I'm like, I'm not weird. I just, I'm training my brain, dude train in my brain <laughs> but as teenagers I don't think they get it eventually maybe they'll train their brain but all right so I'm going to go ahead and save out of this because I'm going to talk about the second assignment so I'm just kind of spending 30 35 minutes a little bit longer depending on how we get into it so we can see how different things work based on what we're trying to accomplish in the assignment 
everyone, lots of people have given me the animal project attempt, how they saw the project, what they were trying to visualize in the animal. And then they're like, ransom note, I think I've only gotten two of those out of the cohort, the eight students in the cohort. So everyone's kind of thinking, maybe it's because, oh my God, this is a lot harder than I imagined it to be. And I got 8,000 magazines from National Geographic that I've saved over the years. And I'm thinking about cutting them up. Or you're just like, well, let's just kind of see what's going on before we see what's going on. So, all right. So the ransom note. I love it. All right. So I'm going to go into the letter piece of paper again. I'm an illustrator. You can do this in Word because all we're going to do is place images. If you do it in Word, place the image, right click on it and say move to top or in front of text in the menu and that'll give you a floatable object that you can move around because the idea of the ransom note is to start visualize letting and kerning. That's the prime example. You ever watch CSI or Law and Order or any of those? And they used to do ransom notes. I don't know if they do ransom notes anymore in these kind of cop things. Is that a thing of the past? Now they text from a burner phone or they do a, you know, a gargly voice from a satellite phone or something like that. Maybe the ransom note has gone by the wayside, but my true appreciation of typography wants to keep the ransom note alive. So I use letters, numbers, and symbols, and I make notes for my kids. Clean your room or else put it on their door. And they're like, what are you doing, dad? I'm like, well, this is the only way you get it. If I text you, you ignore it. Like it's a friend texting you. If I put a note on your door made with letters, numbers, and symbols, maybe you might actually read it. Uh, okay. So Let's go out to the uh, do our internet search because we want to talk about uh, what's called a found object. So the idea with the ransom note, whether you're looking through different letters of fonts and colors and shapes, same representation, I call it what's called a found letter. So if I type in, uh, so I, the beginning of my ransom note is going to be dear sir. So, cause I want to be nice with my ransom note. So I'm going to do dear sir. And then I'm going to lightly jokingly tongue in cheek threaten uh, so that I can get my uh, puppy back. So um, let's, uh, let's take a look for found letter. Cause this is the concept, whether you're using your phone and students have done it using their phone, taking pictures of letters in the world. I don't know if you ever noticed that I took a walk on the biking path back behind the building. I got to get out from the computer every once in a while and get some fresh air. And the utility companies have stamped metal markers in the walk path. And they obviously mean something. It must have been a survey guy standing there and he's marking something in the sidewalk. But if you look really close at it, it's stamped in words curved around this little disc that creates whatever the marker is for it. Or there's a you know, graffiti style spray mark that has a little mark there that they want to use for further future reference, maybe it's paving or something. I don't know what they use it for, but in essence, it's a found letter. So I'm gonna do uh, found letters and I'm gonna put a space and I'm gonna put quotes because I'm gonna look for a certain letter. So I need the D, the letter D. So I'm gonna do found letters and the letter D and I'm gonna go over and look at what I found, no pun intended, for found letters. After you do this project, you're going to start looking in the world and you're going to see letters and everything. And I know that's probably the kiss of death, but I mean, who knew if you looked at a little median curve this way at this angle on your bike or walking, that truly this is a D. Most of you think of ransom found letters. It's just a D in a typed document that creates a different technique. This D versus this D, right? This is a written word, distress D. And this is a printed sign D. I wonder what that sign said. What starts with a D that has yellow? Oh, yield. It's probably a yield sign, right? Is that yellow with a black D? Maybe. Um, so most of you probably think of this as found letters, right? The type that's on the thing and you see it on a sign or a billboard or a door. But look at this found D. And I'm gonna scroll down because there's found Ds. Look at this found D and look at this in essence ransom note with all kinds of funky forks, a little flower, just weird. What is this rulers or tape measures or something making some of these things. These are also found letters. Look at this beautiful thing is from space. I don't know what island is. is that Bahamas or something. Man, that's a nice looking D. Look at the door handle is a 
D. Look at just shapes. Shapes are so interesting to me. And I see letters like all over the place, depending on, you know, where I am, what I'm looking at. Sometimes I'll actually photograph them like this and you can see this entire ransom note alphabet was made with found letters. I don't know if you've ever seen people are selling them now where they do the cities and it says Chicago and all of the letters of the word Chicago is a found letter somewhere in Chicago. That's pretty cool to me. Like that's how my brain works. I see things in shapes. I read the letters or the words later. So the concept behind the ransom note, whether they are found printed letters or they're found letters is to create in essence a note out of individual letters. Now, why is that important? I used to have to use an X-Acto blade with a printed sheet of different fonts and a ruler, and I would cut every letter out. And with my ruler, I would draw a baseline. And then with my magic tape, transparent tape, I would lay the letters out to make my message. And then I would use magic tape over the top so that the spacing was perfect. And that's how I was judged. Did my word kern well enough that there weren't any weird spaces? Remember, slugs, blocks, wood blocks or metal blocks where the letters are stamped or carved or raised into them. And that's how they stacked them in a tray to do the original roll press of the newspaper or any kind of printed document or early copies of the Bible, right? They did it manually. Well, we're doing what I learned with cut paper and magic tape. We're just doing digitally. So I can see that you understand kerning and letting and natural spacing between words and sentences. So that's what this process is. So I'm gonna take the D, I think this is kind of an interesting D. So I'm gonna drag that image over to the desktop. So found letter D, here's my first letter. And then I'm gonna go with E next. So found letter E, let's see what we get. Oh man, look at this thing. What is that thing? Is that a bench? That's a very uncomfortable bench, if that's bike a bench. Rack? But, ooh, might be a bike rack. But why does it look like that? I don't know. <laughs> look at it better. Is it e? Maybe it's the art. Maybe it is an art piece. News E, letter as found art. I can go down a rabbit hole and we can end up reading the article for 10 minutes, yeah. but. <laughs> It looks like it's on its side. It shouldn't be like that. It's an art. Piece. All right, hold on. Let's just explore it real quick. Oh, sculpture of a letter E in a playground. So maybe it's something they climb on to, maybe? Uh, found in a playground at Balboa Park in San Diego. There were other letter sculptures there, too. Huh. Oh, look at this. That's cool. We're found attached to a telephone pole when viewed near the edge of the frame. The upright is implied and seen, but it's actually not there. Wow, this is a great site. <laughs> I, could, I could go through that all day. Uh, okay, so let's close that. <laughs> okay, so I have my E, e. that's pretty cool. I like that, I like the fence post too. Uh, I like, and I've actually done this with students in class. I've taken a piece of paper and I've cut a window out of the piece of paper and I've beamed an image onto the uh, projector, onto the screen, and I've taken the white piece of paper and I've moved it around the image and cut out the window from the piece of paper to show them one tiny piece of the greater image. And I would just move it around the page so I could pull out shapes and letters and show them that you're looking at the world through a lens or you're looking through this little square. And depending on how big the square is or how close the square is to your face is how much of the world you actually see. And so this is just like kind of a little microcosm of kind of that process of that piece of paper cut out in that little square. Okay, so I need deer. So I need an A. Oh, did I drag the E over there yet? I think you got me clicking on it and then I didn't drag it. So let's drag that over. I'm just dumping my letters on the desktop. I actually should minimize this so I can actually see my desktop so I can put these letters out there. All right, so we have uh, E, A, I need, oh, I didn't do it A yet. So I need that. Oh man, look at this, the most uncomfortable chair in the world right there. Stiff, sharp back, little tiny seat. That's the timeout chair right there. <laughs> you wanna be uncomfortable, sit on that. Uh, so we'll do that. And I'm gonna do the R. And I have to tell you when I'm building this kind of process, I don't use the same letter 
same image for the same letter over and over again. I use a different image for the same letter over each time so that you could see the vastness of the effect based on what you're doing. So, and I try not to use found letters of letters. I try to find found images that look like letters. I, this might be a bit of a stretch. Does that look like an R? I mean, I bet if I put it next to the D, the E and the A, you would get it because your eye would just figure out it's an R. But I don't know if this one's interesting. It's like a power cord or so. Oh, it's a, it's a hook. It's one of those hooks. One of those stretchy. That, yeah, to tie it down. That's a buckle right there, a little hook. And that's a hook and it's the strap. But look what happens when it's laying next to the grate. Man, that's really interesting. Look at this thing. This is some kind of rusted something or other. Um, so let's see here. Uh, just for the sake of the process, we got to move this along a little bit because <laughs> I want to talk about kerning and leading and why this is important. So let's do the S for sir. So I'm going to just quickly grab the S's and everything. Yes, it would be easy to follow in the graffiti or the little rubric in the book, but let's see if we, oh, look at this thing. It's like a leaf curled up. I almost, during the walking path today, just took photographs of the cracks in the sidewalk and the branches sticking out of the trees to do the same thing here, but I wanted to do it. Hmm, interesting. Look at this thing. This one? No, the chin. Oh, some, somebody's trying to make that an eye. I guess because of that thing. Well, we're not going to use it as an eye. We're going to use like something like this. This is weird, isn't it? What is that? Looks like a cheese grater in something. This little thing here. And it kind of looks like an upside down eye. But if you, I mean, if you look at it, I don't know, maybe that's a bad one to do. But if I put it next to the S and the R, you probably wouldn't know what it was. It's tough with the eye because all it is is a straight line. So let's do this one for the sake of the process. So we'll take that. All right, so S-I-R. The question is gonna be, so you're also seeing that I'm doing uppercase versus lowercase. So look at this one, this one's lowercase. And just for the sake of it looking different than the other one, I'm gonna dump the lowercase on there. All right, and let's see what it does with a comma. Comma is going to be tricky because it's a thing. So found letter. I wonder if I wrote comma. Fugitives don't use commas. So <laughs> that's true. <laughs> the closest thing I can get is probably this thing because at least someone drew it for the found. This is kind of cool. It's in the book and they're open. Oh, interesting. They cut the bush out in the shape of a comma. Yeah, normally grammatically correct ransom notes don't normally happen, but for the sake of this process, I want it to happen. So I'm gonna use one of these found things that looks like a thing. Yeah, I don't know, this one, I guess. How about just this one? This isn't the best example because it is an actual comma, but at least it's grayed out. All right, so I got a few letters here. So now I got to go into my Illustrator file and I'm actually going to minimize my Illustrator file a little bit and I'm going to hide some of these things so we can start to see what we have going on here. First thing I got to do is file place my first letter, which is this one. And if you know anything about most programs, you can just drag and drop and it drops the thing in there. And I'm just going to scale this thing down so you can see what I have going on. So there's my D. So I need to track down my letters here that I have kind of overlapped all over the place. So I got to drop an E next. Now, something during the process that you should recognize is that A, the spacing of the letters needs to be consistent. So the word reads as one particular word which you can see here. So watch what happens if I move this over. I better have a equal space between that E and the D in my next letter so that you can still read it as the word I'm trying to make. So I'm gonna shrink this down and drop that in. So look what happens if I start spacing this thing out. We have a problem, because this is dip. Ah. Like it's not close enough together. So immediately for me is I got to start bumping these things a little bit closer together. 
So now you can start to see, and I'm actually gonna even bump this a little bit closer, that this is starting to read like the word deer. So I'm, I'm manually kerning, remember baseline. So I'm actually gonna turn my rulers on just so that you can see the baseline for this particular word. I'm trying to stack things up so they go along a line. This is just manually kerning. I'm just having you use letters, numbers, and symbols to start creating legibility and readability as seeing letters as shapes that have space around the shape, which we call negative space. So I'm gonna to try to create the word deer in a way that's legible and readable, right? It's all gonna be different images, but I'm still trying to make sure that this thing reads as the word deer. Hey, that looks pretty good actually. Let me bump this a little bit closer so that my spacing is consistent. So you see a D-E-A-R, and I'm just visualizing this line. I mean, in theory, this line could be, you know, anywhere. I'm just trying to remember baseline is what unifies text and lets you read left to right, top to bottom. So manually, just like if I was cutting out of a magazine and pasting things down, I'm just trying to figure out what the right spacing is so it reads as a word or a sentence, because look what happens if I do that, right? That, that doesn't make sense. It looks like D-E-A-R. So we're in trouble if D-E-A is involved in the beginning of this thing. So I'm gonna move the R back over, right? So dear, that's pretty good. But watch what happens when I drop the S in. So I'm gonna drop the S in. I'm gonna try to figure out, you know, a decent size. So you'll notice the image actually has to be a little bit bigger to kind of match the size. But watch what happens if I do this. I'm gonna zoom out just a little bit. It's starting to look like deers, right? Deers, because the S, look if I move it even closer. It really looks like deers, D-E-A-R-S. But if I do this, so I'm gonna give it in essence what amounts to a double space on the keyboard. I'm gonna put a full letter between the word dear and the word sir. And then I'm gonna drop the I in. And here's another thing that affects the letter, right? Is how much space is around the letter. So look at this thing. Like I'm gonna to have to pinch this thing and overlap it a little bit because the I is way far away. Now, type A personality, if I was using it, I would crop it. I would crop the image so that there wasn't so much negative space, but I'm gonna play with what I got dealt, right? I'm gonna play with what I got dealt. I could do this and move the S in front of the I, and that way I could get a little closer. I'm just trying to visualize how I can get these things to read as individual words and not as individual letters. So I can move this over and look at that. Hmm, that's pretty close. Maybe I bump this a little closer. Dear sir, and I need my comma in here. And so let's bring the comma in. So I'm gonna hold down shift and bring it down. Does the comma normally create a descender of some kind where it goes below the baseline? It does. So I'm actually going to put my comma where it hangs down a little bit. So you can see that visually I'm creating my kerning. I'm creating my double space between the words and I'm creating a consistent baseline. If I stagger these up and down, which I did because the D and the E and the A kind of step down and then the R is a little bit bigger, but I'm using the found object to make sure that the letters are consistently about the same size, even though there might be extra stuff going around the outside of it. So I'm just gonna do the word please. So I'm gonna find the letters for please because I wanna start the word down here for the demonstration, just so that you can see letting wise, what kind of separation we need in order to create this ransom note, right? This is my ransom note. Even far away, I can still read, dear sir. I mean, that's pretty good actually, as far as finding found objects that you can distinctly see. The hardest one's the E when you zoom out because that thing's depth value isn't that much separation. So, and this is in essence, 
what a ransom type type of typeset is. There are fonts out there called ransom and you type them in. All it does is stagger the letters with a box around it. And the box is normally shaded. It isn't a perfect box and it has the letter is negative in it, white inside the shade. And it just staggers it like this. So all we're doing is doing it with found objects, found letters so that we can create in essence the same thing. So let's go with P. I'm gonna do please real quick. So it's the same process I did for all the other letters just so that I can keep, this is interesting. They should have cropped that a little bit more. It's a really friendly like ransom note anchor. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not demanding anything drastic. <laughs> I'm too nice of a ransom note maker. So let's do that P. And then I'm going to do capital L so that it really knows that the found letter needs to be an L. This is interesting. It's air duct or something, some kind of duct system. Look at the tree. That's interesting. They cut the tree and the tree is made an L. Did you, you can use different size as long as the kerning and the leading is consistent. So even if it bounces up and down, just make sure there's visually an e equal space between lines and between letters so that we can read it as a letter. So yeah, the, a, a relative visual baseline, even though the letters may bounce up and down a bit. If you're cutting them out of a the magazine, you should be able to cut the same size square. No, <laughs> right? You're gonna cut all different sizes. So as long as we have a readable baseline, and that there is in essence a double space between the words, we'll get the idea. So, and then just place them into Word or whatever uh, website you saw where you can import things or whatever, um, and just compile them into a paragraph or a statement. It's supposed to be tongue in cheek, so don't give me any aggressive ransom notes, like make it cute, like. <laughs> Yeah, okay, all right. That's a good idea to actually block it out a little bit first. Yeah. Oh, this E is cool. Sometimes I have students give me the same E over and over again in their thing. And I kind of like when it's different because then it becomes a work of art equally. I could use this A again. I don't want to use the A again. I want to use a different A just so that I can get, so you can see found letters. I mean, there's all kinds of things that have to do with this thing. So let's do that. Uh, we need an S. The S's are always fun because you can get any kind of squirrely looking branch or I could spend my life at a state park taking pictures of stuff just to find different letters and everything. I think it's fun to just see what's out there and visually kind of push my brain a little bit. So, all right, so that's that. All right, our last E here. Gosh, there's a lot of E's in my ransom here, so. Oh my gosh, a football for the Super Bowl? I gotta use the threads of the football, right? That's that's a thing. All right, so now I need the P and I'm actually gonna do this a little quicker. So I'm gonna drag that, I'm gonna drag that. Where's my L? I need my L and then P-L-E-A. Where's my A in here? There's my A. And then which S did I use? Have I used one yet? P-L-E-A-S, I think. Did I use this one? What's my left? Blah, 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 blah. Uh, that's an E, so where's my S? This one? Yeah. This one I haven't used, right? Yeah, the other one was a leaf. All right, so there we go. So now I can uh, zoom out a little bit. I'm just gonna move everything up above the document to speed up this process a little bit. Hopefully with all these found letters, I still know how to spell please. So we'll do that. We need that here somewhere. All right, there we go. All right, so the first thing I'm gonna do is I need to scale down the P, right? So when I'm writing my ransom note, I wanna be relatively consistent with the size of the letters, even though they might be different proportions and everything. So watch what happens if I move this right up to there and I start building my ransom note. So let's move that down. And I'm gonna to try to use a visual baseline. The idea is to use floating, letters so let's move that so the trick is i'm gonna to have to bring this to the front so that it cuts off some of my image that's a little bit ridiculous here and you'll notice look at the stagger here i mean i'm starting to get a weird thing going on but that's okay because i'm trying to visualize a consistent baseline so let's take this one move that down 
And you can see what I'm doing here. I got to bring this to the front. Sometimes you get yourself double checking the spelling of things when you're doing something like this, kind of like Eagle in all caps. I'm like, gosh, did I even spell that right? Because it looks a little weird with what I'm doing here. All right, so uh, E, let's do the A. So I'm gonna manually do the kerning. And then once I got these things basically the size I want, I'll figure out the line spacing because the line spacing is gonna be important. But once I have the word spelled out, and you're gonna already notice, I think this word is bigger than that word kind of visually. So I'm going to have to select these things and make them a little bit smaller. So I'm going to scale this down. Gosh, the S and the E next to each other is kind of funky when they're both semi-scripty. So, okay, so let's select this. I'm just going to select them all together. In Illustrator, you can just drag and select it. Yeah, you're right. But I think I might be all right. So let's just move this down just a skosh. So take a look at please here. So I'm looking at the scale of this. It might have to go even a little bit smaller. Let's go down to about there. That looks about right. So what I'm trying to do is create the, the leading to be visually about this much. So you can see that it's pretty consistent across the board, but it gets a little close here. Not a big deal. I want to use this space as the rule of thumb between my rows so that they're still close enough, kind of like a double space, double space, double space, but it allows for a little bit. Your eye is still gonna make that dear sir, comma, please. Wow, please looks interesting when you zoom way out. Still looks pretty good as a word. So there's please. And I could keep going on, but I wanna go in here and let's just do uh, funny ransom notes. And you're gonna see cut paper technique. You're gonna see just, you know, a cut out a bunch of papers and lay it on a thing. You're gonna see different fonts with different colored backgrounds kind of collaged here. Here's another cut paper. This is a ransom font that they typed out and everything looks exactly the same. I'm not looking for this. I'm looking for this. Now this was done manually. The one I did was done digitally, but it's the same concept where they took, look at this, this is a price sticker, $2.19, that's hilarious. To create this thing of staggered letters. Look at this, they cut out words and made the ransom note out of different words. You can see it here too. There's a distinct kerning and leading process for making warning bigger, spacing is good. And each line, even though it's different sizes is pretty visually consistent. So it's okay if some things are a little bit bigger than others. The idea is that we start learning leading and kerning and how the eye connects the dots based on the spacing between things. Like, look at this interesting thing going on. That's a crown to make the M. Ransom note, T-shirt. So look at the spacing here. The letting is consistent between these, but it looks like a headline because they're not close together. When they're close together, they look more like a sentence or a paragraph or something like this. So the the rationale behind the ransom note is to get you manually starting to see what letting and kerning does. So type animal, that's all about background, middle ground, and foreground. And what bold, italic, and regular does to your eye when you start blending and stacking things together. The ransom note is all about understanding legibility and readability and creating a manual kerning and letting process to create a funny little ransom note. So I did it manually. You guys, luckily for you, are doing it digitally. And if you Google any letters, you're gonna get all kinds of letters. So be creative with the process because it really will help you visualize spacing. If it's found letters, it's a lot harder to move them to Kern so that you can read it. Cause sometimes it's kind of tricky just to see the letter. 
But if you do it where it's just stencils spray painted and you took a picture of it, then you're going to be able to kern and lead much easier. And if you create, if you select images that have the same negative space around them, it's going to make stacking them a lot easier too, because there's no stagger. If everything is about framed in to the same distance of negative space, like the P and the S, look at this. I move them next to each other. It looks like PS, even on the desktop. All I did was move them next to each other. So you can see what negative space does to the block too. That's why it was so hard to put blocks in a tray from a tray and lay them in a rack and print on them because the, typically the letters didn't fit perfectly on the block. They had weird negative spaces, W's and M's and C's and things. That's why you had weird negative space, which we call justified, right? Weird spaces in between letters and words because everything was justified to the outside of the rack. Okay, so that gives us the concept behind the application for the ransom note. So I've done pretty good here. I'm at eight o'clock. I've got two little starts to the mini projects. So you can think about them. I'm gonna do 30 minutes with the last one, which is the book cover, so that we can kind of start that little mini project. And then hopefully by 8.30, I can end the recording and I'll give you some time to play in class. If you're not already playing or you just wanna listen back later and play later, that's okay too. Uh, but it gives you an opportunity to kind of explore the same things that I'm exploring. So I'm going to delete that. Uh, if you need to watch the recording back later, cool. If you want to play later with it, that's fine too. I'm um, just trying to walk you through the concept of the process. Okay, so that brings us to the very last thing, the third mini project in our Canvas learning module, and that is the book cover. So I'm actually going to go back to the learning module so we can see what it is. I'm pretty sure everyone's seen a book cover before. So 2.7 is our book cover. Now the book cover we're going to do, we're going to do any story. And I don't know if you've ever heard of Edgar Allan Poe before, but I grew up in Baltimore and he was from Baltimore. So of course I had to do a homage to him and he wrote little short stories. And some of them have turned into much bigger stories over the years and have inspired everything from sports names to plays, dramas, uh, murder mysteries, all kinds of things. But he's got tons of short stories. And the guy was actually short, no pun intended. But I've been to his uh, townhouse row home in Baltimore because it's a museum now. And I don't think the guy was bigger than like five foot tall. His bed's like a small little bed, like a single bed. He lived in the attic and the roof line for the attic was pitched like you would imagine. So you couldn't be six foot tall and walk around in there. And he had a little courtyard behind his house and he wrote all these rather interesting stories. He was a bit of an alcoholic too. So I think maybe alcohol may have played a little bit of a role into some of the things he dreamed up over his lifetime, but he was a very interesting character and you've probably heard of the raven or telltale heart or some of his stories that he uh, had written short stories over the years gosh i've seen so many plays that have reenacted some of his short stories and boy are they interesting depending on who the director was and what version of dark or lightheartedness they took out of his stories but uh, he was quite the interesting character and if you Google him, he's got all kinds of stories. I mean, literally all kinds of different ranges of stories. And the reason I chose book cover is because I want to tackle both letting and kerning, which means the name of the short story and his name, correctly spaced, correct use of visual hierarchy and typography, and then the image itself, which is image as an object. So we're in essence taking the ransom note, letting and kerning, and the type animal, type illustration, and we're gonna create an interpretation, a book cover of one of Poe's stories. So let's go out to, the first thing we're gonna do is just go out to, and let's do uh, uh, Edgar Allan Poe stories. 
And holy smokes, Telltale Heart, The Raven. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Boy, there's some interesting book covers here. Nevermore for the Raven. How cool is that? Uh, the Hideous Heart. Uh, let's do, I'm going to go back and instead of doing an image search, I'm going to go to just all because here are some of his more famous, The Fall of the House of Usher. The Pit and the Pendulum is what every student picks because they write the, pick and the, pen, the pit and the pendulum at the top. They write Edgar Allan o at the, the Poe at the bottom and they make a pendulum out of letters, numbers, and symbols. Pretty standard go for it. And I think, did I have one here? I think I might actually put one yeah, I saw it. in the announcement section. Yeah, so let me see here. Um, so the Raven, some of these are typography. I just wanted to show fonts, spacing and leading just to inspire you a little bit. Black cat, I mean, how cool would this be? Black cover couple of dots. I mean, not a lot to it, but it's trickier than you think because you have to be able to also place the type in a way that gives you a little dramatic visual. Look how tight this typeface is. Edgar Allen's really close together. I don't know if that's necessarily a success story. Gold bug, that's a cool one because you could make a bug and write the gold bug and you're allowed two colors. So you can use gold and black if you wanted to, by Edgar Allan Poe. You're gonna quickly notice the title is big and his name is small. And somewhere in the middle should fall the illustration. Now, somewhere in the middle doesn't necessarily mean big letters, medium-sized bug, small text for name, because what if you put the bug on a black square and made the bug white? It's gonna look much closer to you, even small than a big bug that's black on a white background. So we're gonna start kind of visualizing, playing around with kerning and leading. And there's only three elements, the title of the book, the illustration of the book, and the author of the book. And the title traditionally, in many, 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 many cases, is at the top of the page. The illustration is in the middle of the page, and the author is in the bottom of the page. And if you've ever had me before in a design class, we process in a reverse S. We process information in a reverse S, which means title at the top, focal point of the image in the middle, and author or the last piece of information you want them to remember at the bottom. But you'll also notice the drama of this stripe makes the word bug and the gold really stand out because they're a negative shape on a dark background. So you remember bug and gold over here, even in the reverse S mentality. So reverse S. All right, this is interesting. That could be replicated with words that are white all the way around the outside of the cat. Here's the pendulum, right? The pit and the pendulum. Can you read Edgar Allan Poe? You wanna see what the problem is? You see how that R is touching the P? It looks like a B, right? Yeah, it looks like a B. This isn't necessarily a successful use of leading because you're creating a ligature that makes the letter different. Is it a problem with the A and the E? Not necessarily. I think you read that one okay, right? You actually read that one okay. It looks a little bit like an R maybe because the E goes across the baseline, but I get what they're trying to do. Look at the kerning on how tight this is. You could still read it because it looks like a script hand where they're all kind of tying together. Although pit gets a little close, the I and the T, but you get the idea. We're trying to combine the type animal and the ransom note, 
But now we're not using found letters, we're using normal typefaces, and we're trying to create, in essence, the same technique, but now as a visual object. So let's see here, which one do I want to do? Sometimes I do the heart and I Google like human heart and people are like, oh my God, like I'm trying to make an illustration out of a heart. Um, the raven obviously is the slam dunk. Premature burial is interesting. <laughs> the, cast of, the cast of a monster's I can't really say. Yeah, that, that um, horrible because you just like um, lock someone in a wall. Yeah. Because like you're getting drunk. Yeah. Yeah. You made fun of me or whatever. It's kind of like the telltale heart too, where the person's living there and they can hear the heartbeat and they can't find it and it's in the floorboards. It's like boom, boom, and he's going crazy. boom, 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 trying to figure it out. So let's see what the let's see what we got here. I he's got so many stories. It's like the most ridiculous thing. He was a weird looking dude too. I actually, we're gonna do him as an illustration in digital illustration class on Tuesday night because we do portraits normally. And I'm like, oh, let's draw this guy in Illustrator. So we're gonna learn gradient meshes and all kinds of techniques to do illustrations. So we're gonna create like realism illustrations of Edgar Allan Poe, but he's kind of a creepy guy to begin with. Uh, okay, so let me just see, is there any, where's the list? Oh. Uh, the tell hyphen tail heart. Hopefully, even though we're only in week two, you start to appreciate kerning. Like, look at the spacing of that font. It's very interesting how, here's the cask of a Montilla with this weird bird thing going on. The fall of the house of ushers with this weird tree. A tree is an easy thing to make an illustration out of. It's just branches. So you just make a big thick word for the base and then you branch all the other words off. So if there was a tree, Pit, Pit and the Pendulum has a skeleton for that particular one. Ooh, the Mask of the Red Death. That's kind of an interesting. You could do a masquerade mask and then just do the outline of a skeleton and kind of overlap it. Remember, you're allowed two colors. So if you use white as your background, you can use black and a color. If you use black as your background, you can use white and a color. So depending on your background, you actually can get three out of two colors because the background is your foundation or your artboard and everything on top. Everyone immediately does think, this is interesting. All he did was lines. Boy, that would be an easy way to finish the project okay. and you have an illustration. It's a two dashes, <laughs> but I'm just skimming through real quick to see if, Boy, that's kind of freaky, isn't it? I could visualize making type and making any of these things. So um, the man of the crowd. Hmm. Interesting. Black hat. All right. For the sake of the process, because I've only got 25 minutes or so to keep to my clock of a two hour recording that people can watch back. Let's do the black hat. <laughs> That will be much easier for most people just to give you an idea. So the first thing I'm gonna do, whether you do it in Word and you make the document black or you do it in Illustrator or whatever program, you can always choose the artboard color. So just for the sake of the process, I'm gonna make it black because it's the black cat. Now, here's where we start exploring what we learned in letters as shapes and scale, right? So for the sake of just visualizing things for you, I'm gonna make a really big box and don't count it as anything because I'm just doing it as a space holder. I'm gonna do a really big box that's about one third the entire height of the document. And I'm gonna take another box and I'm gonna make it like one sixth of the size of the document. I'm just gonna move it up here a little bit. So for me, visually, to create visual separation, I see as the title being one third of the entire document, right? This big. And if it's the black cat, that may mean two lines of text, the black and cat, but it should fall in about one third. We call it one third, two third design, not 50-50 where the headline is one third and some representation of the visual is two thirds. So 
it's really easy to do eyeballs for the cat. And if I get rid of this box, that's two thirds. So even if I did just two eyeballs and it made this entire black area feel like part of the cat, it would be two thirds. And the words, the black cat would be one third, just so that visually you can see that. Now I made this box one six, because remember I said, if I'm gonna do visual separation in typography and I'm using word as an example, if I make my headline 72 points, if I wanna make something appear smaller, I have to go down two steps in the point size. So if you know anything about the character palette, it goes from 72 to 60 to 48 in Word or Illustrator or any program that uses a, a point system. It's traditionally 72, 60, and 48. So if I want the headline, the name of the book to be 72, his name should be no bigger than 48. Now, depending on, so let's say I want the headline to be large and I want the cat to be medium and I want his name to be small. Well, instead of going two steps down, maybe I go four steps down, double two, because two is medium or middle ground. So if 72 is foreground, 48 is middle ground. So we go 36, 24. 24 is background. So if 72 is point, is headline or foreground, 48 point, if I was using letters, numbers, and symbols as my medium or middle ground, and if I want background, which in this case is name, in most cases, we got to keep stepping down. So we go 72, 60, 48 for middle ground, 36, 24, 24 for background. Now, if I do white text on a black background, that may make 24 look bigger because it's what we call a knockout or a negative letter. So making backgrounds black and text white makes it more dramatic. So what can I do if I don't want the white letters to appear so bold on a black background? I can do italic, right? Because that's more like a personal conversation. Bold, if I make it bold in 72, that's gonna be the headline, right? Because I'm yelling at you, and it's the biggest. If I go all the way down to 24 and I also make it italic, it's going to be like a personal conversation in a crowd, right? It's going to feel like a little bit smaller. If I make it italic and change the color so it isn't so graphically bold, now I go from yelling large white letters on black in 72. 24 point italic in yellow, red, green, blue, some other color that isn't such a high contrast as black background white text. Now I'm getting something that appears dramatically smaller. So the very first thing I have to do, so I'm gonna move this. For me, visually, I can do it without boxes, but for you, I'm just gonna move that box over. The very first thing we have to do is type in the black cat. So if I do all uppercase, am I yelling more than all lowercase? Yes. So if I make it big, make it white, and make it all cat, it's the biggest I possibly can make it. What if I make it bold? Yeah, really yelling. If I make it big, and I make it all caps, and I make it bold, it's the loudest I can yell at you in my layout. If I make it all lowercase, regular, and yellow, I'm going to make it, even though it's 72 point, it's not going to be the same yell. It might be someone that doesn't have as, as deep a voice, right? They're still yelling, but it's not as loud as all caps, white, and bold. So visually, I'm separating the written word, and I'm trying to visualize what is making the statement I want. Remember, communication is foreground, 
middle ground and back black uh, background. So if I really want the name of this thing to stand out, I want to make it white letters, black background, the biggest font I can, and all caps and bold. So for me, I think I want to make it, if I make it uppercase and lowercase, I'm making it kind of middle ground, right? Lo all lowercase, kind of making it more subtle, upper and lowercase, kind of making it middle, all caps, bold, making it really foreground. So scale matters, but if I made it really big and made it really dainty little font, and I put it in a different color, scale doesn't necessarily make it foreground. It's the dominance of the shape in the space. So you might notice Telltale Heart and it has all these drippy letters and it's red on a black background and it's really skinny font. The heart illustration is gonna stand out way more than the word Telltale Heart if it's a dainty typeface. So now you're starting to see that font plays a role in scale and foreground and dominance as well. Now I'm gonna keep with Myriad just so that I'm using the same font family for you while I'm creating my design, just so that you can see, you can do this all in one typeface that has a big family member, or you can fall in love with fonts and go down your font book. Now this computer has so many fonts, I could be scrolling for days to find exactly what I'm looking for. So the black cat, big title, black background, little eyeballs, name at the bottom. That's what I want to do. So I want the black cat to be two thirds, the little eyeballs be in the middle, remember reverse S, and then his name down the bottom, a little bit smaller, so that I can create my background, middle, ground, floor. Now, if the eyeballs are really kind of freaky right in the middle of the page, and I don't use a super heavy font, will that become foreground? Yeah. Like if the eyes are freaky? Yeah, if the eyes are freaky and they're right in the middle, remember reverse S and your focal point goes to the middle of the page. Even if they're small, if the font is dainty, those eyeballs are going to become foreground and the black cat's gonna become middle ground. Even though I made it huge, I can make it huge. If those eyeballs are more powerful weighted wise than the letter forms, it will be foreground and the word, the black cat will be middle. I actually think I might wanna do that because that would be interesting to have the letters really big, but have them dainty and then have these eyeballs like staring at you in order to kind of make this thing. So, all right, so let's type in the black cat. Now, if I want the eyeballs to be like really dominant, watch the difference. I'm gonna type in the black cat. So here's my letters and I'm gonna to go to my font. And remember, I don't want it to be this uh, too bold of a thing. So let's just do differences so you can see what happens. I'm gonna do condensed. I'm gonna make the letters really big. I'm going to make them white. And it's the same problem solving I would be doing in the Word document if I was doing a Word document. So I'm just going to minimize that. And I'm just going to move this right here. For scale and proportion purposes, I'm going to put this in the top, all lowercase. Now watch the difference. This, so let's see what the font size is. So just for the sake of the process, just so that you can see kind of the stepping technique, I'm going to crank this up a bit to like maybe uh, 110. And I'm going to move it to the middle of the page. And I'm just going to kind of move it down. Remember font to front or type to front if you're in Word or some other program, just so that you can freeform kind of move it around. And watch what the difference is. I'm going to move this over. And watch what happens if I go bold. Right, look at even the size difference at 120. It completely goes off the page. Watch what happens if I do condensed italic. It like squeezes itself into this tiny little space and there's lots of space over here. Watch what happens if I make it capital T, capital B, capital C. Right, I'm starting to find a happy medium of weight here. Now, when you're using Word or any program 
to lay type in a sentence, all of them have this spacing, right? So all I'm doing is putting a spacing between the letters. So watch what happens if I go like plus 100. Does black still read as black? Does it make it yell less, less bold? It does actually. By spacing it out, it doesn't make you feel like the black cat. It makes a little bit more like the black cat. So I'm actually gonna make this smaller in scale now, just so that you can see the difference. So I'm gonna go down to a hundred. Let's tuck that back in. I'm just gonna put it in the middle. Upper and lower case is middle ground. All uppercase is foreground. All lowercase is background in the scheme of visual hierarchy. All uppercase, all bold is like foreground, foreground, foreground. Upper and lowercase in a basic or italic, regular or italic is a middle ground. All lowercase in a condensed, a light, something that makes the weight of the letters not so thick is background. So watch what I do. And I'm actually gonna move this box over to here. And I'm just gonna make a copy of this. And let's, uh, let me go back here. And I'm gonna copy his name right out of here just so that you can see upper and lower case, paste it. Here he is. So now, just for the sake of the process, I'm going to make the font much smaller. And watch what happens if I make it all lowercase. So the headline is big, it's not bold, it's not all caps. So I feel like it's yelling at you, but it's like a more conservative yell. This in all lowercase, some version of italic or condensed, something like this one actually is all condensed italic. So you can see the difference becomes much more submissive, like in the background. Look if it's small, but I make it bold. I mean, it's starting to compete. Like if I do that and take a look at this, so let's let that minimize. I mean, we're starting to compete visually, even though that's bigger, look at how bold this is. Like visually, they're almost on the same level, even though this is much smaller than this. And that's because it's condensed and it's bold. I mean, it's got less kerning, well, watch what happens if I need to compete against that. Watch what happens if I just do this. So I'm gonna crank it up to like 300. Spacing. By adding more kerning, it's spacing it out. It's trying to compete against the bold. It's all lowercase, which means I'm not yelling. It's not uppercase. And we're not having a conversation upper and lowercase but I'm competing because all lowercase is more like a whisper, but I made it condensed. So now we have this kind of dichotomy of lowercase, but bold, and it's on white on black background. So it's really trying, but if you squint, I could still read the black cat. Edgar Allan Poe starts to become a stripe. Like visually it's starting to become more of a stripe because I added kerning between the letters. So I need to crank this down a notch because I want the eyes to be, foreground-ish. I want the name of the book to be middle ground and I want his name to be background. So if I wanna definitely make sure his name is the background, I want to first make it dainty. Then I wanna change the size. So look what happens if I add kerning and make it small and make it condensed. Look at the difference in scale visually of the shape of the letter and the spacing and size and font, all in the same font family. Now watch what happens if I introduce my second color. 
I mean, if you squint, this thing is really bright and this thing starts to blend in the background. The great equalizer for visual separation is font, font weight, size, and color. Font, font weight, size, and color. So if I want it to disappear, I want small size, small font family, which means italic or a regular typeface, and I want to make the color closer to the background. So if this was a white background, I would want, so watch what happens. So I'm just going to do this real quick, just so you can see the difference. White. Let's make this black. And let's make this even worse. So let's go, right? Even though, and look at the difference, black background, white text. This one isn't yelling nearly as much as the drama of black background, white text. So this becomes what everyone says, oh, you've got a modern design. Well, modern just means lots of white space. White background, lots of kerning, lots of big counters and bowls and like skinny stems and everything. When you do that, all of a sudden it becomes a modern design, right? They call it white space or negative space. This has lots of white space and negative space, but I gotta go back to the other one because my concept was that the eyeballs and cat's eyes are all kinds of weird colors. So red eyes would make this cat really possessed looking. So I don't know if I necessarily want red to be my other color. I did see in some of the designs that they used yellow because cats do have some pretty funky yellow eyes. So let's just, we're just gonna play with this thing so we can see what we have going on here. So let's do, so I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna do an O because look what the O looks like. And I'm going to rotate this. I don't know. Let me just see what I have going on here. So let's make it yellow. So I'm just playing around a little bit. So let's make it all this bright yellow. So make sure this one is the same bright yellow. It is. So let me figure out the eyeballs here. I think I need it to be some kind of dot or something. So what do I got as an option here? Um, in the scheme of the fonts here, I'm just scrolling through the thingy here. So I either can do a period. Oh, so let me see. How about, let me try this. I'm just trying to figure out what becomes the biggest squish effect here. So let's get rid of that maybe. And let me do this and then a squiggly line. Yeah, I know what you're talking about there. Uh, I'm thinking maybe a comma, I don't know. Let's see what happens. I wanna use type. So I either got a stack O's or periods. This is gonna be one freaky cat. Let's see what we got here. Oh, that's like a super possessed looking cat. Let me do this. Object, transform, reflect, and you could just flip it in Word too. So let me just see something here. This cat is an interesting looking cat. And what if I make them white, right? I want it to be foreground for the eyeballs. So, and I could do a lot of different eyeballs. I could do little periods and I could make them bigger and smaller in order to fill my little shape in. I wanna use typeface. I wanna explore the possibility of typeface. So let's see here if I do, um, let's see here if I just do that, which is just a parentheses. Oh my God, this is like a Siamese cat. Like, so yeah, let's see here. I'm just playing around. I could explore this thing for days. Uh, let's do that. I'm just gonna make a copy of it and I'm just gonna reflect this. 
so that I get some kind of hook going on here. And so now you can see, even though this technically is larger, I could even make these eyeballs smaller and they would still be foreground. It's not looking like a nice cat. Well, what if I move the eyes apart? We have a cat and I've never had cats in my life, but my 13 year old, we decided it would be a good idea to get him a cat. So now we have Mr. Meow is his name. He named him Ollie P. Meow, but we just call him Mr. Meow now. And he lives up to his name because he meows all the time. And he gets three scoops a day via an automatic cat feeder. And he's learned to lay by the bowl at certain times of day. I mean, cats are a piece of work. But I'm trying to find out if I'm allergic to cats or not, because when I'm around Mr. Meow a lot, I don't feel as clear <laughs> as when I'm not around Mr. Meow. So I don't know if there is a Mr. Meow cat allergy scale like if you can google it like webmd and say if you feel like this you may be um but either way i'm gonna suck it up because it's his cat <laughs> oh really so we have a four pound dog who is hypoallergenic so he doesn't shed he has real hair so he goes and gets a haircut and it is a, a morky so yeah so there's a few breeds that they breed that are hypoallergenic, kind of like golden doodles, I guess, nowadays. Now they do golden doodles and those are hyperallergenic. Uh, we've always had like little dogs, so like miniature style dogs. So I'm not allergic to him because he doesn't have dander. But the, oh, yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, animals certainly are a handful, uh, especially when your kids are younger and you lean all the burden. Like now my 13 year old, he changes the litter box and does the things he has to do for the cat. And my 15 year old is gravitated to the dog. So he takes him for walks and stuff. And there is technology now to make it easier like the automatic cat feeder. So we don't have to worry about feeding the cat. It just spits out when it's supposed to. And we have a little automatic litter thing. So that's kind of automated too. So technology is crazy. I don't have the one that spins that's like super fancy. I just have the regular one that kind of cleans it up every once in a while, but nonetheless, okay. So last but not least, I'm thinking maybe I want to do some ears or something. Yeah, just for the sake of the process. So we already know we can do that. Let me scale it up. I'm going to rotate it. I don't know, but we're going to see here in a minute what this thing looks like. So do ears tilt a little bit, maybe? I'm gonna do one of these. This is like a demonized version of a black cat. And I've had some students, boy, they really, they really enjoyed the animal type and animal. So they got into the book cover and they did this really, oh, wrong way really involved. I'm trying to do a simple one because it's a short demonstration, but just trying to figure out this cat. His ears might be a little big scale and proportion wise. I think I might have to make them smaller. So let's do that and do that. So I can tinker around with a little bit. It's a little too close to the name. So let's move them down here in the middle. I actually think I would probably do a little bit more of maybe this and his head's a little squished together, but you know, you get the idea. And so I'm trying to generate foreground, middle ground and background, or maybe I want it to be the name is more important. So maybe I want to go with a bold, let's lower the, Hang a little bit here. Why is that? 
And now we're really competing because I have a traditional kerning. I have a heavier typeface. And even though this now is starting to be smaller in scale of this, because remember the black background is filling in the negative space to make this cat feel bigger, we're creating foreground, middle ground. And this is by far the smallest, but I need yellow. So let's see what happens if I make his eyeballs yellow. Ooh, yeah. And so now we're dealing with kerning. We're dealing with spacing, which is leading. We're dealing with visual hierarchy, which means scale and proportion, different font families. And we're still dealing with type as an image because we're creating something. Now watch what happens if I just, I just like to just show different applications. What if I just make like he's in a hallway or a window or something? So let's make this black just so you can read it. Like, look at the difference. I mean, everything is different basing on, based on background, color, black versus white, scale, size of letters, size of images, weight, bold, regular, italic, and color to get this thing. Now look at the eyes, they're really foreground because your eye immediately goes to this like oof, color in the middle. Even though this is bold, condensed, italic, and it's pretty big, your eyes go right to here. Look what happens if I do this. Two thirds, one third. This actually looks like his mouth by the eyes being yellow and this being kind of spaced out in all lowercase. If you squint, it looks like he has a grin. Watch if I do this. I can, but there's no distortion in this particular project. <laughs> yes, if I did this and I did effects and I went to warp and I could do like an arch. So let's do, uh, let's do, and I could do that. Yeah, I could arch it, but I try not to let you guys do any kind of distortion the first two weeks, because as we get a little bit further along, I'll let you squish things and pinch them in and squeeze them a little bit. Like it's totally different. So if I outline this, Right. Yeah, it's totally different if I squish this thing. So we're going to get to distortion because once you understand visual separation, you understand visual hierarchy, how things look, background, middle ground, and foreground, and you understand legibility and readability, kerning and leading, then we can start <laughs> rotating and flipping and making things different. And then we're going to introduce color where you'll be able to use all kinds of different colors. But color only works if you understand all those elements. If you don't understand all those elements and you start throwing a bunch of color on the page, you're not gonna get any visual separation. It's just gonna look like a bunch of gunk on the page. So, uh, okay, it's 8.45, went about 15 minutes, 25 minutes or so, a little bit longer to break in the three projects, but I wanted to make sure I covered the mini projects in the main outcomes or, kind of what we're targeting in each of the mini lessons so you can see the growth of typography. I'm gonna end the recording. I'm gonna end the share and everything so that when I upload it to the uh, announcement section that you have everything there for you to kind of recap and listen to as you do your projects. Remember, I'm gonna turn on learning module three, probably Monday, because I normally do it at the beginning of the week. But remember, we're working on this all the way up until class time if we need to next Thursday. So if you most people have the animal 
illustration already in. Well, we're doing the ransom note, which will take a little bit of time. If you're doing cut paper or found letters or whatever you do, if you really want to kind of give it a shot, take your phone out and wander around your neighborhood and see if you can find found letters to make your ransom note and take pictures with your phone. And they also have Instagram, I think has grids or something where you can actually put pictures in boxes and it makes rows and you can actually make some ransom note in Instagram grids or something they call it. And there are ones out there that do that. But if you really wanna challenge the ransom note, try to find letters, found letters with your phone or the words you wanna put in your ransom note and take the pictures yourself. And then leave a little note in the comment section. Just so you know, Professor, I found all of these letters in my ransom note. Eh, just a fun challenge. Most people won't do it, but if you want to and you're over the weekend and people are shopping and you don't want to shop, wander around Coconut Point or Bell Tower and see if you can find the letters for your ransom note. And last but not least, the book cover. Uh, so we're going to explore those elements. All you need is the title of the book. Edgar Allan Poe is the author and some type illustration to showcase the main element. If it's a heart, maybe it's using text to make a little heart. If it's a pendulum, it's the swinging thing. If it's the golden bug, maybe you wanna to try to make a bug out of letters, numbers, and symbols. And remember you're allowed two colors. So like gold bug, it's obviously, it's gold. If it's telltale heart, you're probably gonna make the heart red because that's the nature of telltale heart. Uh, but I'm okay if you make telltale hearts, heart blue. Sad, kind of got some kind of personality to it. So you don't have to follow the norms if you don't want to. But let's see what you come up with. And just like week one, as students submit things, I'll screenshot them and put them in the announcement section. Sometimes students say, oh my gosh, you got too carried away. There's like 8,000 announcements in week two. Yeah, when I get things that I think are cool, I try to put them in the announcement section to inspire you. Also remember the discussion board. If you see something cool, maybe you want to show, share it with a classmate just so they can see, you know, something cool you stumbled upon. Okay, gang, it's 845. So I want to uh, shut this down so that the recording is done. Have a good week.